Fire Alarm by Michael Lowey. This is part five of chapter one, and this is the last part of chapter one. Thesis 17. Historicism rightly culminates in universal history. It may be that materialist historiography differs in method more clearly from universal history than from any other kind. Universal history has no theoretical um, anature. Its procedure is additive. It musters a mass of data to fill the homogeneous empty time. Materialist historiography, on the other hand, is based on a constructive principle. Thinking involves not only the movement of thoughts, but their arrest as well. Where thinking suddenly comes to a stop in a constellation saturated with tensions, it gives that constellation a shock by which thinking is crystallized as a monad. The historical materialist approaches a historical object only where it confronts him as a monad. In this structure, he recognizes the sign of a messianic arrest of happening, or to put it differently, a revolutionary chance in the fight for the oppressed past. He takes cognizance of it in order to blast a specific era out of the homogeneous course of history. Thus, he blasts a specific life out of the era, a specific work out of the life work. As a result of this method, the life work is both preserved and sublated in the work, the era in the life work, and the entire course of history in the era. The nourishing fruit of what is historically understood contains time in its interior as a precious but tasteless seed. Against the quantitative historicist conception of historical time as accumulation, Benjamin here outlines his qualitative discon discontinuous conception of historical time. There's a striking affinity between Benjamin's ideas here and those of Charles Peggy, an author, an author with whom he felt a deep sense of oneness. According to Peggy in Clio, a text published in 1931, which Benjamin might have read, the concept of time proper to the theory of progress is precisely the time of the savings bank and the great credit establishment. It is the time of interest accumulated by a capital, a truly, a truly homogeneous time, since it translates, transports into homogeneous calculations and transposes into a homogeneous mathematical language the countless varieties of anxieties and fortunes. Against this time of progress, made in the image and likeness of space, reduced to an absolute infinite line, he sets the time of memory, the time of organic remembrance, that is not homogeneous, but has full and empty moments. It is the task of remembrance in Benjamin's work to build constellations linking the present and the past. These constellations, these moments, wrested from empty historical continuity, are monads, that is, they are concentrates of historical totality, full moments as Peggy would put it, the privileged moments of the past, before which the historical materialist comes to a halt, are those which constitute a messianic stop to events. Like that moment in July 1830, when the insurgents fired on the clocks, these moments represent a revolutionary opportunity in the battle, today for the oppressed past but also doubtless for the oppressed present. The messianic arrest is a rupture in history, but not the end of history. One of the notes explicitly asserts, the Messiah breaks off history. The Messiah does not appear at the end of a development. Similarly, the classless society is not the end of history, but according to Marx, the end of prehistory, the history of the oppression and alienation of human beings. According to the preparatory notes, the universal history of historicism is false. It is a mere artificial accumulation, the way Esperanto is a false universal language. But there will one day be a true universal history, as there will be a true universal language. And the messianic world, which is the world of universal and integral actuality, this messianic history of delivered humanity will burn like an eternal lamp that includes the totality of the past in an immense, oh, 
fuck, I hate this word, apocatistasis. In the letter to Gretel Adorno announcing the writing of the theses, Benjamin particularly draws her attention to the 17th insofar as it reveals the connection between this document and the method of his earlier researches. Benjamin's works on Baudelaire are a good example of the methodology proposed in this thesis. The aim is to discover in Les Fleurs du Mal, a monad, a crystallized ensemble of tensions that contains a historical totality. In that text wrested from the homogeneous course of history is, pres is preserved and gathered the whole of the poet's work. In that work, the French 19th century, and in this latter, the entire course of history. Within Baudelaire's accursed work, time lies hidden like a precious seed. Must that seed fructify in the terrain of the current class struggle to acquire its full savor? Thesis 17a. In the idea of classless society, Marx secularized the idea of messianic time. And that was a good thing. It was only when the social democrats elevated this idea to an ideal that the trouble began. The ideal was defined in Neo-Kantian doctrine as an infinite task. And this doctrine was the school philosophy of the Social Democratic Party, from Schmidt and Stadler through Natorp and Vorlander. Once the classless society had been defined as an infinite task, the empty and homogeneous time was transformed into an anteroom, so to speak, in which one could wait for the emergence of the revolutionary situation with more or less equanimity. In reality, there is not a moment that would not carry with it its revolutionary chance, provided only that it is defined in a specific way, namely as the chance for a completely new resolution of a completely new problem. For the revolutionary thinker, the peculiar revolutionary chance offered by every historical moment gets its warrant from the political situation. <clears throat> but... It is equally grounded for this thinker in the right of entry, which the historical moment enjoys vis-a-vis -vis a quite distinct chamber of the past, one which up to that point had been closed and locked. The entrance into this chamber coincides in a strict sense with political action, and it is by means of such entry that political action, however destructive, reveals itself as messianic. Classless society is not the final goal of historical progress, but its frequently miscarried, ultimately achieved interruption. The concept of secularization employed by Benjamin in this thesis is probably a reference to Carl Schmitt's political theology, according to which all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theolo theological concepts. Schmidt is admittedly more interested in counter-revolutionary philosophies of the state, but he also formulates some more general hypotheses that might have interested Benjamin. <clears throat> I think I lost my spot. That may have interested Benjamin. He writes, for example, that the exception in jurisprudence is analogous to the miracle in theology. However, as Jacob Tobbs has very ably demonstrated, secularization for Schmidt is not a positive concept. On the contrary, for him it represents the devil. Schmidt's aim is to show that secularization leads the juridical theory of the state into an impasse, because it is ignorant of the foundation, the roots of its own concepts. This is not Benjamin's standpoint. For him, secularization is both legitimate and necessary on condition that the subversive energy of the messianic remains present, even if as an occult force, like theology in the materialist chess player. What is to be criticized, insists Benjamin, is not secularization as such, but a specific form, that of social democratic neo-Kantianism, which turned the messianic idea into an ideal, an infinite task. Those chiefly implica implicated in this were the Marburg University group of philosophers to which Alfred Stadler and Paul Natorb, two of the authors mentioned in the thesis, belonged together with Herman Cohen. We find here a striking similarity with ideas developed by the young Shalom 
in his unpublished notebooks from the years 1918 to 19. He rails there with incredible virulence against the fraudulent imitation of the Jewish messianic tradition the Neo-Kantian Marburg School has, in his view, perpetrated. The messianic realm and mechanical time have produced, in the heads of enlightenment thinkers, the bastardized, accursed idea of progress. Because if one is an off, off clearer, the prospect of messianic times must necessarily be warped into progress. This is where the most fundamental errors of the Marburg school are to be found. The distortion of everything into an infinite task in the sense of progress. This is the most pitiful interpretation prophecy has ever had to bear. We may wonder whether Benjamin did not have these ideas in mind when he wrote the theses of 1940, unless it was Shalom who was inspired to write this by his discussions with his friend in 1916 to 19. Benjamin reproaches Neo-Kantian inspired social democracy above all for its attentism, the Olympian calm with which it awaits, comfortably installed in empty and homogeneous time, like a courtier in the anteroom, the inescapable advent of the revolutionary situation, which of course will never come. The alternative he proposes is both historical and political, and it is both of these things inseparably. It starts out from the hypothesis that each moment has its revolutionary potentialities, and in it an open conception of history as human praxis, rich in unexpected possibilities, and able to produce something new, stands opposed to any kind of teleological doctrine that trusts in the laws of history, or in the gradual accumulation of reforms on the safe and sure path of infinite progress. This political action, which like any revolutionary praxis has a destructive dimension to it, is at the same time a messianic interruption of history and a leap into the past. It has the magical power to gain entry, literally key power, to a chamber that has until now been locked away, to an event that has until now been forgotten. We find here once again the deep, close messianic unity between revolutionary action in the present and the intervention of memory in a determinate moment of the past. The rediscovery with the rise of the feminist movement of the 1970s of the forgotten, locked away texts of Olympe de Gouges, the author of pamphlets denouncing slavery and of the, de of the Declaration of Rights of Woman, who was guillotined under the terror in 1793 is a striking example of this. For a century and a half, the official historiography of the French Revolution had forgotten this tragic, subversive figure. The concept of the classless society with all its messianic charge occupies a central place in this thesis, and indeed in the whole of the document. It is a crucial political and historical reference point, serving as a goal for the struggle of the oppressed and a criterion by which to judge systems of oppression past and present. As one of Benjamin's notes says, without some sort of essay of the classless society, there is only a historical accumulation of the past. To this extent, every concept of the present participates in the concept of Judgment Day. Thesis 18. In relation to the history of all organic life on Earth, writes a modern biologist, the paltry 50 millennia history of Homo sapiens equates to something like two seconds at the close of a 24 hour day. On this scale, the history of civilized mankind would take up one fifth of the last second of the last hour. Now time, which as a model of messianic time, comprises the entire history of mankind in a tremendous abbreviation, coincides exactly with the figure which the history of mankind describes in the universe. Jitzite, now time, or the present time, is defined in this instance as the model or foreshadowing of messianic time, of the eternal lamp, of the true history of mankind. To explain the concept of the messianic arrest of events, Benjamin refers, in one of the preparatory notes, to Henry Fossillon, who spoke of the brief, perfectly balanced instant of complete possession of forms. The messianic monad is a brief instant of complete possession of history, prefiguring the whole, 
the saved totality, the universal history of liberated humanity. In a word, the history of salvation, to which one of the notes refers. As is well known, the monad, a concept that is neoplatonistic, Neoplatonist in origin is, in Leibniz, a reflection of the entire universe. Examining this concept in the Arcades project, Benjamin defines it as the crystal of the total event. Once again, here we come upon the idea of abbreviation, the enigmatic historiator Zeitreffer. On this question, an interesting line of argument is suggested by Giorgio Agamben. The messianic time which comprises all of history, Benjamin actually uses the word zeusamenfist, literally seizes together, is reminiscent of the Christian concept of an anachifeliosis that appears in one of Paul's epistles to the Ephesians. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, which in Luther's translation becomes Alle ding zusamen verfacet word in Christo. Scheitzeit comprises all the messianic moments of the past. The whole tradition of the oppressed is concentrated as a redemptive power in the present moment, the moment of the historian or of the revolutionary. In this way, the Spartacist rising of January 1919 sees a unique constellation formed with the Scheitzeit of the ancient slave rising. But this monad, this brief moment, is an abbreviation of the whole history of mankind as the history of the struggle of the oppressed. Moreover, as a messianic interruption of events, as a brief instant of liberation, this act of revolt prefigures the universal history of saved humanity. We might then regard Thesis 19 as a stunning example of an immense abbreviation of the history of mankind up to this point a crystal encapsulating the totality of the cat catastrophic events that constitute the thread of that history. But in that image, the only foreshadowing of redemption is negative. The impossibility for the angel of history to awaken the dead and make whole what has been smashed. Thesis A. Historicism content contents itself with establishing a causal nexus among various moments in history, but no state of affairs having causal significance is for that very reason historical. It became historical posthumously, as it were, through events that may be separated from it by thousands of years. The historian who proceeds from this consideration ceases to tell the sequence of events like the, be like the beads of a rosary. He grasps the constellation into which his own era has entered, along with a very specific earlier one. Thus, he establishes a conception of the present as now time, shot through with splinters of messianic time. It is the constellation formed by a present situation and a past event that makes the latter a historical fact. To give an example that was dear to Benjamin, and in which thousands of years certainly separate the historian from the event in question, the discovery by Engels, drawing on the works of Morgan, of the primitive community as an important historical reality, is inseparable from the modern struggle for the new community, the classless society. This approach breaks with the blinkered determinism of the historicists and their linear evolutionary vision of the course of events. It uncovers a privileged connection between past and present which is not that of causality or progress, for which the archaic community is merely a backward stage that is of no interest in the present, but a secret pact in which the spark of hope shines out. The, sp the splinters of messianic time are the moments of revolt, the brief instants that save a past moment while effecting a fleeting interruption of historical continuity, a break in the heart of the present. As fragmentary partial redemptions, they prefigure and herald the possibility of universal salvation. These splinters refer then to the imminent or potential presence of the messianic era in history, which will be evoked in the last of the theses. This is an idea of Benjamin had carried with him since youth, as witnessed this astonishing passage from Shalom's unpublished notebooks of 1917, 
in which we see Shalom, who, where Judaism was concerned, regarded himself as his friend's mentor, refer to Benjamin as an almost canonical source. In the idea of the Messianic kingdom, one finds the greatest image of history on which infinitely profound relationships between religion and ethics are built. Walter said once, the Messianic kingdom is always there. This insight contains the greatest truth, but only in a sphere which, to my knowledge, no one since the prophets has attained to. Qualitative time studded with messianic splinters stands radically opposed to the empty flow of the purely quantitative time of historicism and progressism. We are here in the rupture between messianic redemption and the ideology of progress at the heart of the constellation formed by the, con uh, by the conceptions of history of Benjamin, Shalom, and Franz Rosenzweig who draw on the Jewish religious tradition to contest the model of thought that is common to Christian theodicy, the Enlightenment and the Hegelian philosophy of history. By abandoning the Western teleological model, we pass from a time of necessity to a time of possibilities, a random time open at any moment to the unforeseeable eruption of the new. But from the political standpoint, we are also on the central strategic axis of the recon reconstruction of Marxism attempted by Benjamin. Thesis B. The soothsayers who queried time and learned what it had in store certainly did not experience it as either homogeneous or empty. Whoever keeps this in mind will perhaps get an idea of how past times were experienced in remembrance, namely in just this way. We know that the Jews were prohibited from inquiring into the future. The Torah and the prayers instructed them in remembrance. This disenchanted the future, which holds sway over all those who turn to soothsayers for enlightenment. This does not imply, however, that for the Jews the future became homogeneous, empty time. For every second was the small gateway in time through which the Messiah might enter. First, Benjamin rejects the approach of those who turn to soothsayers for information because they are enslaved by the future. If you think you know the future, you are doomed to passivity, to waiting for the inevitable to happen. And this remark applies equally to that modern form of the ancient oracle, the scientific predictions of historical materialism transformed into an automaton. Jewish tradition, by contrast, demands the remembrance of the past, the biblical imperative, Zakir. But as Yosef Hayim Yerushalmi observes, what the Jews seek is not the historicity of the past, but its eternal contemporan contemporaneity. Similarly, the revolutionary in his present action draws his inspiration and his fighting spirit from remembrance and in that way escapes the baleful spell of the guaranteed, predictable, assured future offered by the modern soothsayers. Certainly the most striking passage in this thesis, and the one that has given rise to most debate and comment, is its conclusion. What we must emphasize, first of all, is that it is not a matter of awaiting the Messiah, as in the dominant tradition of rabbinical Judaism, but of bringing about his coming. In the preparatory notes, after comparing the messianic interruption with certain ideas of Henry Fossillon, Benjamin quotes the following passage from the art critic on the current French expression, faire date. It is not a question of breaking quietly in on chronology, but of bursting suddenly in on the moment. Benjamin belongs to the dissident tradition of those who were known as the Dohaki Hackets those who hasten the end of time. This theme was surely inspired almost word for word by a work which was, from the 1920s onward, one of his main Jewish sources, Franz Rosenzweig's Star of Redemption. For Rosenzweig, every moment can be the last. That is what makes it eternal, but it is not a question of waiting. The future is not a future without this anticipation and the inner compulsion for it, Without this, wish to bring about the Messiah before his time. Without these, it is only a past distended endlessly. This conception stands opposed, of course, to all doctrines of progress. Thus, the real idea of progress resists nothing so strongly 
as the possibility that the ideal goal could and should be reached, perhaps in the next moment or even in this very moment. Historical remembrance and subversive praxis, heretical messianism and revolutionary voluntarism, Rosenzweig and Blanke are combined in this dialectical image of the coming of the Messiah through the small gateway. For Rolf Tiedemann, Benjamin's proposition here is an impotent decree that leaves out in account any analysis of reality. It is, he argues, more of the order of anarchism and putschism than of Marxist sobriety. Admittedly, from the 1929 article on Surrealism onwards, Benjamin set it as one of his objectives to add a measure of the intoxication and anarchist spontaneity the Surrealists embodied to Marxist sobriety and discipline. But his objective was not so much to decree revolution as to plead for conception of history as open process, not determined in advance, in which surprises, unexpected strokes of good fortune and unforeseen opportunities may appear at any moment. It is not so much a question of putschism here as of being able to grasp the fleeting moment in which revolutionary action is possible as with great presence of mind, the anarchists of the FAICNT and the Marxists of the POUM did in Catalonia in the summer of 1936. To cite only one example, which Benjamin doubtless knew, even if he does not seem to have grasped the entire significance of it at the time, by opposing the fascist uprising through force of arms and by establishing a genuine socialist and libertarian state of exception, though alas, it was short-lived. But what does the tradition of the oppressed consist in, if not in the discontinuous series of rare moments in which the chain of domination has been broken?